Hey friends, Erin from The Impatient Gardener here. Welcome to a long overdue Q&A video. So I will be getting to some postcards. I got a lot of mail to catch up with at the end of this video. I'll put a timestamp for you if you're here just for that. But today I am doing uh, a Q&A to try to answer all of the questions that have come from the tour videos. Now, as I film this, which is the Sunday of Labor Day weekend, I have one more tour video to put up, which will go up before this video. Um, but I'm answering all the questions I could kind of find that people might be interested in prior to that. Thank you so much for all of your love on those Q&A videos. Um, you know, I think people who are really into it really wanted to see the stuff in detail and people who aren't kind of passed over them and that's totally fine. Um, but a lot of you, and I recognize a lot of you people as long time uh, viewers, always nice to see you there. And it's nice that you guys have been liking those videos. Before I start with the Q&A, I want to say a heartfelt thank you to all of you. The love and support that you sent our whole family um, after I posted that we lost our dog Odin was, I mean, I, it was, I was just overwhelmed by how incredible and generous you all were with your condolences. I set out to answer and make a comment on every single person who commented on that video and then I just couldn't keep up and so I hope I got your comment. If I didn't, please know that I read them. They meant the world to us. Um, some of you even sent cards, which was just incredibly touching. Some of you made donations to pet charities in Odin's name and uh, that to me is the most amazing thing, uh, you know, to have a little bit of a li some good come out of that. I mean, that is that is so touching. So thank you a million times over. Uh, Dorothy is doing better. She is slow to adapt to being an only dog. I don't think it suits her. I don't think it suits her pretty very well, but she's going to have to deal with that situation. Um, but she's doing okay, and I would have her out here if it weren't for the fact that it is blazing hot and quite buggy, which is why if you see me fidgeting around, it's because there are bugs around here, and it's driving me nuts. I am in the tiny little bit of shade that I can find because it is hot today. It's also why I haven't really done my hair, because the very next thing I do after I film this video is I am going for a swim in Lake Michigan, which I haven't done yet this year, uh, because it is that kind of day. So. Let's move into the questions. Thank you all for your comments and your questions on these videos. And I hope I get to your question here. Ellen says, hi Erin, your garden looks gorgeous. I've been trying to pack out my flower beds, but I'm always concerned on planting things too close together. Would you say you plant closer than what the tag recommends? Yes, I would. I do not plant closer than the tag recommends or I try not to with shrubs and trees. But with perennials, I often do and with annuals, I pretty much almost always do. So annuals, I'm just going, for, I mean, you don't have to worry about the long-term health of an annual. There is no long-term health of an annual. You got to get that thing through maybe six months if you're, if you're lucky. So that's all I'm worried about is, is just making it fill up as quickly as I can. Same thing kind of with perennials. Um, I've had this conversation before. I tend to plant things, you know, like when I worked on that garden with Roy Dibley, he planted everything on 15 inch centers. Didn't matter what the tag said on anything. And the idea is that you go back and then in future years, you adjust, you take one out here, you take one out there, you divide this, you divide that. But by planting things close together, early on, you fill up the ground, you block the light to the ground, and you reduce the amount of weeds. So yes, I'm a, I'm a packer, in it, but I don't do that for shrubs, for shrubs and trees, because you can't move those. And you don't want to end up in a situation where you have to constantly prune a shrub just to keep it in the space that you've allotted for it. Janet says, I like how you mix your dahlias into the landscape. I need to try that. It is my favorite way to grow dahlias. And I feel like, um, I don't know, I think it's really strange. I mean, I like them so much. I think they're beautiful flowers. And I would not appreciate them nearly as much if I just had rows of them or just filled up raised beds with them. You know, I appreciate plants that are in front of me all the time. And so that's how I choose to grow them. You know, they're, um, you have to deal a little bit, be choosy about the varieties you pick because obviously like a one that grows five feet is not generally the best solution for that. And you do have to come with a, up with a staking method, um, but these are all easily overcome and worth it, I think. 
Case Shield says, thank you for sharing. I love the wild magic basil. Is that just one plant per grouping? So that is planted along the front beds, along the patio there. And yes, what I showed there is just one plant. It gets huge, two and a half feet by two and a half feet. Um, now, in that video, I showed you that I had lost one. I have now lost two just this week. Another one did the complete wilt thing. So I don't know if I'm dealing with a downy mildew issue. I mean, there was no sign of any health problems with it until it just went. Now it is pretty dry. I haven't watered over there. I know there's, I've mentioned this before. I know I've got some uh, jumping worm situation in there. I don't know what, I don't know what the problem is there, but it's interesting to me that now I've lost two and the, it's the same with both wilted fine one day and fully wilted the next. I don't know what it's about. This one I didn't pull out. Um, I just cut it off and maybe I'm just going to see if it reflushes just to see what happens. Um, Grow For Me 5B, they have a YouTube channel by the way, so feel free to check that out. Uh, and I think their garden was on the Garden Conservancy tour this year, which is a big deal. Uh, your thalictrum looks awesome. I had to take mine to the ground this year. It was pretty gross. I've been able to grow the lavender mist variety from seed I collected. Have you ever tried to grow the black stockings from seed? I haven't tried to grow any thalictrum from seed. I don't think there, there are some varieties that are not difficult to grow from seed. I don't know if black stockings is one that will come true from seed or not. So no, I haven't tried it. And I've actually never tried, you know, I don't grow a ton of perennials from seed. Um, it's a patience problem, as you might imagine. Um, so no, I've not tried that. Susan says, will you pop the lemon lace elderberry in the ground in fall to save it or using it as filler in the planter? So I have a lemon lace elder, lemony lace elderberry in the urn in the middle of the garden. And my plan is to plant that in the ground. Um, the problem with that, of course, is that I want to keep enjoying that planter as long as I can. So there's this weird thing at which you have to sort of make that decision of when are you going to rip that container apart to get that elderberry in the ground early enough that it still has time to establish. And I always feel like here, even though our frost comes late, um, you know, we, we get a little, our cold springs pay off for us in warm falls. And so here in particular, my little microclimate close to Lake Michigan, um, our frost comes a bit later. So I do have a little bit of extra time, but you know, it's, it's not a ton. So it's always a, it's always a judgment call on when you, when you call it quits and, and throw something in the ground. Deborah says, do you do anything for your Japanese beetle? She says they get them in Southern Michigan every year. Um, yes, I do. You wouldn't know that from these videos where I just show you them. No, I go, I hand pick them. I go around and hand pick them. I don't spray. I don't use traps. Um, I don't use milky spore. I know a lot of you guys talk about milky spore. If it works for you, go for it. I haven't seen, you know, enough evidence. First of all, I haven't seen any sign of issues in my lawn. So they are not just, the grubs are not, I mean, my lawn's kind of crap anyway, but I've not seen issues of uh, grubs causing a problem in my lawn. Um, and the research that I continue to read on milky spore suggests that since Japanese beetles come from like 10, five or 10 miles around, unless a lot of people are doing it near you, it's not gonna make a big impact. That said, I don't think it hurts much. So if you wanna try it, you should go for that. Our Brown was the HS Princess from Longfield. So I don't know the answer. It might have been. Longfield has never sold that variety, but one year I ordered HS Date and got that one instead. And so I think that might have been the one from Longfield. NEVND says, Erin, you may not like your wall. She's talking about the little stone retaining wall that I have um, on the side garden here. Um, but I think it looks great and, and like that it's exposed in places. It adds a dimension to the garden is attractive. I'm not sure exactly what I said in that video, but I just want to close up. I do love the wall. It's just that I will not be ever building one of those again because I built that, well now 11 years ago, 12 years ago, I was a decade younger and I built it entirely by myself. Um, a Mr. Much More Patient was, was on the road most of the time back then. So I did a lot of these projects by myself. Uh, no, I will not be taking on a project like that. There is another question in here that's coming up um, about how I built that wall. And I actually have a blog post about it. So I'll put a link to that uh, in the description below. Uh, long story short, I laid it out, dug a trench. I mean, I'd have to check the blog post to be sure, but probably six to 10 inches deep, packed it full of paver vase, made sure it was level. And then I just started putting the tears on. Uh, Lisa says, 
Great tour, Aaron. I really enjoy all your plant descriptions. Do the deer go after your sedum? Yes, they do a little bit. Like it's clearly not their favorite choice, but I feel like they test it every year. So I do make sure to spray the sedum when I'm doing my regular deer repellent. Anna says, um, she says she's gotten rid of her lawn and she has a permaculture yard and she wants to fill it with plants and she wants advice on ways to get inexpensive plants. She says she's um, an experienced gardener, but not an expert. She said, I'd like more places to buy seeds, especially native that draw those pollinators and maybe a few sneaky ways to get cuttings. Oh, I mean, what an amazing question, right? So in terms of seeds, um, yes. So I would say, you know, look for perennials that are easy to grow from seed. There's a lot of them out there. And, you know, it takes, in a lot of cases, you can get first year flowering perennials. I mean, the whole, um, it was just at Ball Seed, and the whole, is it Poco Loco? One of their lines of Echinacea are first year flowerers. So like you can like start those, you know, and they'll be blooming and you can enjoy them that year, which is crazy. Some perennials aren't like that, but perennial seeds are a great way to go. Um, there are some good sources for native seeds. It's probably best rather than me just thinking of these off the top of my head right now is that I put some links in the description uh, for places to go. But the other thing I want to recommend is um, look for plant sales in your neighbor, in your, your area. Look for like master gardener groups and garden clubs often have plant sales where they are digging from people's gardens. And so you get really nice plants um, for very inexpensive. So look for those things. And you know, you never know, go to those things, chat people up. I mean, a lot of gardeners are very happy to share plants when they discover that someone is interested and you know they wanna you know, do what they can to help you. So, you know, chat up some gardeners, try to hit some local plant sales. I mean, that's sort of uh, one of my favorite places, you know, to, to look for to look for plants uh, when you're on a budget because they will definitely be less expensive than, you know, from at a nursery. Okay. Um, Christine says, is that Joe Pieweed near the garage? Yes, it is. That is like straight Eupatorium. Well, I don't think Joe Pieweed is Eupatorium anymore. It's another one that they changed the taxonomist changed the name of it. Anyway, you all know what Joe Pieweed is. It is the straight Joe Pieweed. So it is like probably nine or 10 feet tall and it stands up and it's really good. And that is not full sun over there. So it does a great job over there. Uh, Patricia says, I also have a silver umbrella Aurelia that I got a few years ago from Broken Arrow Nursery in Connecticut. So here we've got them. It's just right over here. I don't know if you can see it right there. Uh, she says, like yours, it is massive and spectacular. However, it suckers like crazy wherever its roots roam. Plain green thorny little devils that tear you up when you try to wrangle them out. Vicious little creatures. But their mama is worth every drop of blood and then some. So yeah, you know, this is one of those things that, that we're asking about that plant. I always get into the details with that, which is that uh, the roots send out suckers and they can be quite far away from it. And you have got to get in there immediately as soon as you can and cut those things out. First of all, they are, as she said, the thorniest. They're, this thing is called um, Aurelia. The common name of Aurelia just in general is devil's walking stick. It's because it's just covered in one trillion thorns. So you got to get in there and you got to cut out those suckers like right away because they are much more vigorous than the mother plants and they will take over if you don't if you don't do that so i do look for them i usually get them when they're only about this long and i just take my pruners and i cut about an inch underneath the soil and that seems to manage them fairly well esther says uh now this was in the side garden tour she says do you know the name of the fern at the right at 1811 she says she thought it was um ethereum nipponicum pictum but when she bought two more they turned out not to be the same. So uh, Pictum is probably the most common of the Japanese painted ferns, but there are other ones out there. I think those might be regal reds. So I'm not positive, but when I look at regal red, I think that's what those are. So there are several variety cultivars of Japanese painted ferns out there. So, you know, just, you know, they're not all the same when you're trying to match. Stephanie Sharkey says, are you going to dig up the banana this year? How can I not? 
Now the banana has, is a, has a life of its own. It probably needs an Instagram account for crying out loud. So yeah, I'm gonna, I guess we're gonna dig it up again and go through that again because why not? Linda says, uh, I think this is now the, I think now these questions are mostly coming from the, what I call the circle garden, which is the oval and the side garden uh, and some of the containers. Um, but it doesn't really matter because this question pertains to all of them. And I should have addressed this earlier in the tour videos. Linda says, do you have drip set up or do you hand water everything? So I have drip in the very skinny bed alongside the patio where I've got all the tall dahlias and I have it in the vegetable garden. And we did run drip in the new planting between the neighbors, just so we could keep up on the watering. That is not a permanent drip situation. That will come out probably in two years. We live in a climate where now granted this year has been a drought and I don't know that, and, and everyone's climate is changing. And so I don't know, you know, what used to be the same normal for us is not necessarily normal for us anymore. But I will say that you know, this is an area where traditionally we get enough rainfall. So I believe in, in doing what they call growing plants hard. And that is not babying plants because, so what I do is I water plants to get them established. So yes, that often means hand watering. This year I've been using sprinklers a ton just because we've had not a lot of rain. So sprinklers are not a great way to water garden beds. You know, they tend to flatten plants and you get a bunch of water on leaves. But you know, when you got to cover a lot of area, a sprinkler certainly is an efficient way to do it. So I've been really using a lot of sprinklers this year, but that's because we're in a drought year. So let's say we weren't. I would mostly be hand watering new plants. That is basically what I do uh, for the first year. Trees and shrubs get probably two years of love, but after that, they have to survive on their own because that is not, I'm not up for a garden that can't do that. Like I'm just, that's just kind of one of my non-negotiable things. I'm just not gonna be watering all the time. Um, you know, actually this year we've had issues with water. Our well is, has a couple of times, there's been no water left to run. Now it rejuvenates itself by the time we need to take a shower the next morning, but it is not an unlimited supply. So, um, and I think unless you live in an area that is like a desert, basically, um, I don't think it, I, I don't advocate for using drip systems in general. Um, you know, especially, I mean, annuals, you got to keep up on them a little bit. Although I don't water the annuals that are in the bed across from, uh, the patio garden, generally speaking. In fact, they get less water than a lot of the other areas. Um, I just believe in trying to help plants get established enough that they go find their own water. So if you live in an area with sort of semi-normal rainfall where you can do that, then I think that's the thing to do um, because otherwise we're using water that we don't need to be using. And uh, why would we do that? Single lady, who wants to do the Beyonce song, says, um, I love the shorter but more detailed videos. What are the two boxwoods that are potted on the oval garden? There are actually four. They are all planted in pots in there. Um, I used to have them in the ground and then actually it was Brad from Garden Evolution who said, why don't you just put them in pots? Which is great. It raises them up so I can see them. Um, those are all green velvet. Those are all green velvet. Green velvet is probably the one that works the best for me. So I tend to look for that one. Those are all green velvet. Um, they probably would be hardy in the pots, but the pots themselves are really cheap pots that are not frost proof proof so they all go into the unheated garage in winter and they've been in those pots now for three years maybe uh, living with big dog says maybe think about bottomless pots for the trees so I had showed you the birch trees that are in those big pots and um, a couple of people brought this up so Bunny Guinness famous garden designer British garden designer um, brought up the or has a video on cutting the bottom off of pots and then plunking them in the ground and then you essentially create a tree that is growing higher you get the beauty of a pot if that's the look you're going for but the roots can keep going down i think it's a great idea i've never tried it because 
all of the places where I want trees that I have in pots, I mean, I could do that with the boxwoods, although boxwood roots are so shallow that they'll probably never get to that low. But like in the case of those birch trees, I want those on the driveway. They, I think they help decorate the driveway and I wouldn't want them in those grass areas. So the places where I've always grown trees in pots, I grow them not in a place where I could plunk them in the ground even if I wanted to or cut the bottom off a pot. So I think it's a cool idea. I think it's one you should consider. I just don't personally have a space that is applicable to that. Michelle says, can we get a tour of your mom's garden? I love the one you did a few years ago. I will try, we'll see. Like me, you know how this is. You don't want people to see your garden when it looks not at its best. So, you know, and we all, you know, when you look at a garden, you don't care but when it's your garden, you do care. So we'll see if I can sneak in there and get that done. Peggy Ann says, I appreciate how you show the successes and messes and explain why. I grew, gave up on roses due to soft fly larvae. How do you control them? I'd like to try again. Okay, soft fly larvae. Yes, total pain in the butt. A couple of things. So, you know, I'm just gonna throw this out there and then duck and cover. If you are a person who is okay with a fairly aggressive synthetic chemical solution, that bare three-in-one rose fertilizer, which is also an insecticide, uh, does manage them fairly well. However, you know, there are lots of negatives to using stuff like that. So if you'd rather not do something like that, I have had success with um, dusting the plants with uh, diatomaceous earth and then dusting the ground around them with diatomaceous earth. The problem with diatomaceous earth is that when it rains, you gotta reapply, but it does work. So those are a couple of things that you might wanna think about. Uh, Ms. Maddox says, I love the circle garden, Erin. Does it bother you to see the bright blue porta potty from your house? So that was totally, I should have brought it up, but I thought, well, maybe no one will notice. I don't know what I was thinking. Th in the background of that, there was a, porta potty that was like hey here I am that was left over from the garden tour event that we had had I think the night before I filmed that video and they hadn't picked it up yet so um, we have had some porta potty issues with the neighbors porta potty because they're doing all this construction as you know they've moved it around in a, a bit now and so most of it's, it seems to pop up in different places it hasn't been right ne next to us for a while we're very grateful that, for that because you want to talk about awkward situations is when I'm walking out to my car in the morning and one of the construction guys is like walking into the porta potty like two feet away from me. It's like morning. <laughs> it's bad and they don't smell good as you might imagine. Anyway, long story short, uh, that porta potty did not bother me there because it went away. It was just temporary and I just figured I wasn't worth explaining in the video. But I guess I should have because a lot of people asked about it. Um, does the chive hedge, oh, this is from DLS 1240. Does the chive hedge help keep bunnies out of the flower garden? <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know. Maybe. I feel like it doesn't hurt. I don't know if it would keep them from doing it or not. But I do think maybe it helps. We haven't had knock on wood. We haven't had a huge bunny problem here for a couple of years because we've had a pretty good fox population. I have seen a few around. So they're not gone. But... Um, I, I do think it helps. I certainly wouldn't rely on that as my sole method of protection. Uh, Melissa Martin says, what do you do when a plant nursery mails you a sick tree and won't refund your money? And I'm gonna, she told me what nursery it was and I'm going to name it here, which I normally wouldn't do this, but this, she says the nursery is Nature Hills. Uh, and I guess that's Nebraska. Um, so, I don't think I'll get myself in too much trouble here. That nursery, um, how do I want to phrase this? I have personally had friends who have used that nursery and I have talked to people who have used that nursery and it is almost always a bad idea. Uh, they have, I mean, somebody I know ordered thousands of dollars worth of plants from there uh, because she just couldn't find them anywhere else. Half of them didn't come. When they did come, sometimes they substituted something that wasn't supposed to come. The ones that came were basically dead. Um, the thing to do when you're going to try out a new nursery. Now, again, I have a blog post on this actually about how to buy plants online. I'll put a link to that below. But there is a tool on Dave's Garden called Garden Watchdog in which people essentially rate 
on, or nur online nurseries. So go read the reviews. A place like, like I just talked about will have almost exclusively negative reviews. It's not uncommon to get one or two negative reviews because um, we look for that. That means it's genuine, right? But that place will probably have nothing but negative reviews. So I would just say go check our watchdog um, before you go buy from place. Uh, long story short, uh, for um, uh, Melissa, they absolutely should refund your money. I don't know that you'll get that out of them, to be honest. Ann says, I love your bench at 639. Where did you get it? My mother, my dear my dear mother-in-law who passed a few years ago gave us that bench very early on when we she was she was so supportive of me as a budding gardener and so she bought stuff for our garden and for us and uh they're treasures now i don't i think she probably just bought it at a local at a local garden center probably she says uh, I think someone else said this actually. What do you think of Firelight Hydrangeas compared to Limelights, which is your favorite, and what do you think of Limelight Prime? I like this question. So first of all, uh, Firelight Hydrangeas are a much airier look. They have smaller flowered heads that are airier. Limelight, you know, has these big lunkers of flowers. So I think they're both fine plants. I think you should just see which look you like better. I don't think, I mean, Firelight obviously uh, pinks up a little bit better um, and earlier than Limelight. So if that's a factor for you. So I would say in terms of those two, just pick the one that you like the look of better. Now the Limelight versus Limelight Prime thing is a very interesting discussion. And to cut to the chase on this, I would say if I were buying Limelights today, I would buy Limelight Prime. So Limelight, Limelight is 22 years old now. The patent has run out on it. So now there will be other plants that are up. Anybody can sell it now. Um, you won't probably find it as Limelight because that specific name is trademarked. But the plant itself you'll find anywhere um, now. Um, if people are still propagating it. But Limelight Prime is an improvement on that. They just happened to release it right when the patent was running out on the other one. It's a touch shorter. Keep in mind that there are Limelights out there that are 12 to 15 feet tall. I don't think most people want a hydrangea that big. Mine would probably be all of 15 feet tall if I didn't prune it as aggressively as I did. The other thing is that not all limelights are the same. Some have much stiffer stems than others. Um, you know, there's some theories out there about what happened that I, since they're theories, I probably shouldn't repeat. I'll just say that not all the limelights are the same that are out there. I think the benefits you get with a Limelight Prime are worth just seeking that one out. It's going to be more than, because now you're going to be able to buy Limelight under 18 different names, because um, it's not patented anymore. Um, but, so that would be my thing. Sorry, we ran out of battery there. Um, what I was saying is, I would take Limelight, personally, I would take Limelight out of the equation if I were buying plants now and then just decide if you like Limelight Prime or Firelight better. Pamela says, I'm, I'm feeling ready to divide overgrown established plants and maybe remove ones I'm less than wild by. Advice? My advice is go for it. That's the freaking best part of gardening. Um, first of all, get rid of the ones you don't like. I used to hang on to plants that I called placeholder plants for ages because I'm like, oh, I'll just wait till I find the perfect thing to put there. All the while sort of secretly hating what was there. It was so great when I just decided to ditch those and said, I'll put an annual there for right now for crying out loud. Um, the day that I got rid of, ripped out the last, other than the ones that keep popping up in random places, the last of the daylilies in my garden, I was so happy. I personally, some people love daylilies, grow them by far. I don't care for them. And I was sort of hate growing them. It felt great to get rid of them. And then in terms of dividing your established plants, you know, first of all, I should be, and probably most gardeners should be dividing our plants more than we do. Dividing plants in most cases rejuvenates them, uh, gives them you know, fresh new, an area to have fresh new growth on them. It's good for the plants we have. It's good for increasing your stock. 
Um, I think it's probably something that American gardeners probably don't do enough of. And as my gardens start to fill up more, that's what I want to do more of. I mean, I don't just want to always be running out and buying truckloads of plants. I want to be, you know, finding the plants that I really love in my garden and then putting those same plants in other places by dividing them. So go for it. I think it's very empowering to do that in your garden. Luann says, I miss the mixed drinks. Yes, there has not been a wine and weeds since spring here. Uh, you know, wine and weeds is something that I sort of created with uh, Laura over at How's It Growing. And um, the good news is, is that Laura and I are going to be in the same place at the same time in a few weeks. And so maybe we will film a few in-person together wine and weeds episodes. We'll see. Either way, we'll try to get some back because I miss mixed drinks too. Kimbar says, um, you should think about adding oak leaf hydrangeas for height. This is in the shade garden. If they tolerate the dry shade once established. Uh, fabulous idea. I love it. I love oak leaf hydrangeas. I think they are stunning. I have a real hard time growing them. I think partly it's because our soil is, is not remotely acidic and they do appreciate a more acidic soil and it's sort of dry shade and of course they don't appreciate that. So um, they never get in my garden that I've experienced get to be what they are in other gardens. But it's not to say I shouldn't try again and add some soil acidifier and bulk up that soil and be really good about watering them. I know, because they're, they're worth it. They're lovely plants. Um, MD Walker says, I'm excited with my newly planted seersucker carex. Cool little plant. Have you tried wood aster? Well, she says, cool little plant. I have the white variety. They form lovely patches in dry shade. Funny you mention that. Yeah, I bought like three of them at uh, Roy Diblick's nursery this spring, and I planted them. Where are they? I don't remember seeing them during that tour. This is what happens. Hopefully, I just am not noticing them, um, and I'll see them in spring. They are a great plants. Um, Jan says, Erin, I was wondering if you have a favorite plant that contrasts with all the green. I'm in a dry climate, zone three, 6B. Uh, yeah, so what do you do to contrast with all that green? I can think of a whole bunch of white plants for shade. I cannot think of a lot of super saturated plants it's like saturated color plants um, there are some really like japanese anemones um, which are white or pink i think those are beautiful in shade um, so you get some actual color in there you know i um well dry shade i was gonna say the aurelia sun king but that's not really as i pointed out in that video it doesn't really like being dry i don't know why don't you guys share your suggestions in the comments for that? If you've got a colorful plant, um, obviously your variegated plants can help brighten up shade. And of course I've got that um, Dryopteris brilliance in there, which will be orange uh, at some points of the year. So those are some options, but you guys, why don't you share some suggestions? Cause it's A.L. Jardin says, you solve my Aurelia Sun King mystery. We're just getting to this. Uh, she just mentions that hers was planted on a dry shade bank and hasn't done as well as her neighbors. And now we figured out why it's the dry thing. Now, m a couple of springs brought out the Chasmanthium latifolium that I planted, which is the sea oats, as being careful because it's a thug. Uh, yeah, it's a, well, you know, I'm always, anything that's a, uh, that has a name like that, like you should know, like it's gonna reseed a lot. Um, and anything with a seed head like that, you know it's gonna reseed a lot. I'm gonna, I mean, come back to me in a few years and see if I'm regretting this, but I'm gonna say for now I'm okay with that because that area gets overtaken by all kinds of other things. So if those spread and seed around, it's fine. They're a beautiful plant. Interestingly enough, one note about that plant was that when Nick McCullough and Allison McCullough and Teresa Woodard wrote that book, American Roots, that I was very honored to be included in, one of the plants that they spotted in almost every single garden they visited, because they went to, what is it, 23 gardens around the country, was Chansmanthium latifolium. And um, I think, and it's in their garden too, in, uh, in Nick's garden in Ohio. You know, I think it's one of those plants that has so many great attributes. And uh, maybe like pygnanthemum, like if, if, it, if you have to keep it in check a little bit, like it's worth keeping it in check a little bit. Now, another person says, I'm a thug fiend and even I had to draw the line in Northern Sea Oats. 
Um, so anyways, she says, she says it is so pretty to see those golden coins dancing in the breeze, but it's just too aggressive for her. So, you know, I think it's, it's a good to put a little thug warning on that plant and duly noted. This is sort of representative of many comments regarding the Brunnera. I'm so glad to hear that your Brunnera have reverted to green. I thought mine was the only one that did that. How come this happens? So variegated plants, it is not uncommon for variegated plants to not be stable and revert to green. Um, I'm sure there is a whole bunch of botanical explanation for this. Um, why does this happen in plants that are named? Well, you know, honestly, some plants are, and I'm not saying that's necessarily the case for this, uh, but it could be. Um, some, plant, some variegated plants are tested and grown out in testing fields, but they aren't tested long enough, like maybe they're tested for five years. And maybe that's not long enough to see if they're going to revert because, of course, plants live a long time. Um, sometimes they're sort of rushed out there because they're so cool looking. They know people will buy them and then they lose their variegation. Uh, in a plant like that, there's very little you can do. Now, occasionally with a hosta, you'll come across that. Um, you'll get some new leaves that are not variegated. And the, the thing to do with most variegated plants, and, and I don't believe this would have worked with that Brunner rub because I don't actually remember it slowly reverting. I feel like just one year it was all green. But one thing you can do is go in and cut out the, the non-variegated portions of a plant right away. Because as I mentioned, like with the Aurelia um, that I have over here, the non-variegated parts of the plant are always more um, vigorous. So if you cut those other ones out, they won't be able to take over the whole plant. So that's something to look for. But why does it happen? I mean, sometimes it happens because uh, plants are just going to revert. You're fighting. I mean, variegated plants are kind of fighting nature. Uh, so, you know, sometimes nature wins on all that. Jeanette and many other people said, I didn't notice you have any hellebore in your shade garden. I do. And I think I pointed it out unless I edited that out of the video. I have probably four or five established large hellebores and then a few years ago i planted a bunch of very small ones in another part of the shade garden which haven't started blooming yet so yes i do have hellebore i think they're nice plants i personally don't get so excited about them that they are the kind of plant that i'll go out and spend 25 dollars on someone mentioned the stinking hellebore and that is one that i've had my um i've had my Ion, and I would like if I see that one in a nursery, I will definitely pick that one up because that one's quite interesting. Has really pretty um, kind of leaves that look a lot like the shredded umbrella plant. Uh, Sandra says Solomon seal for that whole empty area. I kind of pointed to an area in the back. Thank you, Sandra. Excellent, excellent suggestion. Solomon seal is another one that for me doesn't move around quite as much as it does for the rest of the world, but I don't know. Kay says. Question from one gardener to another. My husband and I are moving out of Wisconsin in early May next year. What do you think of having uh, landscaping edged and mulched this fall? Yes, I think it's a great idea because if you do that this fall, those edges will still be looking really good by April or May when I presume you're gonna be, people are gonna be looking at your house to buy it. And the mulch should definitely last that long. So I think it's a great idea. The landscapers won't be as busy this fall you will be busy doing a billion other things to get your house ready to sell next next spring. So take that off and you will prevent any early weeds that might pop up or help prevent them from coming up. So I think it's a fabulous idea. And I think that's it. Not that that was short. Okay, that is all the questions. We are going to uh, move on to um, some mail and some postcards from you guys next up. But I will be in a different place because it's hot and I'm going for a swim. I'll catch you. Catch you later. All right, I'm back. It's actually a week later. I had a fabulous Labor Day weekend. So fabulous that I spent the rest of the week sort of catching up on all the things I should have been doing when I was kind of busy soaking up summer. So we're back. Uh, postcards and cards time. I have a lot of mail to catch up on. It's been a while since I've done one of these. I love these. The idea behind this, in case you haven't seen any of these before, is that I'm inviting people to send me a postcard or a card, whatever, uh, with 
um, a little bit of what they took inspiration from when they visited a garden. And that could be a garden down the street, a garden across the world. We've been getting cards from everywhere and they are amazing. So let's just jump right into it. By the way, I apologize for the lawnmower. I hope it's not too bad. I might have to move. But the lawn really needs to get mowed. Okay, first one is from Kuchenhof. Greetings, visited my daughter in Amsterdam and was amazed with the variety of tulips. What an incredible place. Uh, she says, pronounced Coke in Hof. <laughs> I've ordered so many bulbs to plant in the fall. I can't wait to see them. Love from Bangor, Maine. This is from Wendy. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, what a fabulous trip. I think Kuchenhof is probably on everybody's list, right? Next up is from RHS Wisley, another, this is a fabulous UK garden. Hello, Erin, this isn't the postcard I wanted to send you. Um, I spent some time in London in June and wanted to send you a postcard from the Super Bloom at the Tower of London, but they didn't have any. I am so loving this big shift in gardening to natives and sustainability. Wisley was amazing. I can't wait to go back and spend more time there and visit a few more RHS gardens. Happy late summer. Your garden is stunning. This is from Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie. What? What a fabulous trip. And thank you for sharing that. Nestled at the top of Lake, oh boy, here goes me with the pronunciations again. Stehekin, only accept, accessible by boat. This kind and lovely man gardens, keeps bees, and raises goats for milk and cheese. I was surprised that even a wild and native area can be improved by the presence of a garden. Tended to with amazing care. This is from Kathleen. And this postcard comes from what's called the garden and it says organic gardens with vegetables. Oh, and this is from Stehekin, Washington. I'm sure I'm saying it wrong. And Carl Gaskill is the gardener. What a cool place. See, this is very interesting to me, a private little garden that, you know, I wouldn't have heard of otherwise. Oh, look at this, a postcard from one of my favorite places. This is from Northwind Perennial Farm. This is uh, Roy Diblick's nursery. Uh, Dear Aaron, went to a wedding in your neck of the woods and had to stop in to see Roy's place. Amazing. Only problem is that I flew and bought only items small enough to fit in my suitcase. A Carrick's Montana I will treasure as a reminder of this nursery. Happy planting. Love, Jennifer. Oh, that is so, that is so sweet. Jennifer, I'm so glad you got a chance to go there. It's so much fun. Hi, Erin. Another beautiful day at RHS Bridgewater in Manchester, UK. 156 acres designed by Tom Stewart Smith. Even the gift shop was fabulous and the cafe. Cheers. This is from Libby. Um, fabulous. Uh, and I love Tom Stewart Smith. In fact, that entry garden that I have, um, the one that's just Hacklacloa and Pagoda Dogwood, was highly influenced by a Tom Stewart Smith garden that I saw, um, mostly in its simplicity. I think he, I don't know if he was using Hacklacloa in his, but it was the same concept. It was trees with just grass everywhere below it. Bouchard Gardens, uh, love your segment on the Encente Banana. Mine seems a bit short and stubby, but we'll try a bigger container next year. Thanks for all the great vids. This is from Tim in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. Essentially, it says, I can't read part of the writing because I always put the code over it. It says basically Bouchard is a must see. Um, so I think that he made this post. Oh no, this is a Bouchard postcard. Oh, he put a picture of his banana on the back and I think it's looking great. Okay, this is a pair that goes together. By the way, I'm just gonna say, you guys know that I appreciate stamps. The stamp game is strong on these two. Check those out. Hi, Erin. The story of this unusual garden was told to us as follows. A man from Sicily was employed as a digger for the subways on the East Coast. He saw advertisements for cheap land in Fresno, California, and decided he was done living in a cold climate and working in the dark. He wanted to move west and grow citrus, so he invested everything in that dream. When he arrived, he found out his land had, here we are in part two, just a few inches of topsoil over a type of sedimentary rock called hardpan. Growing citrus was out. In addition, Fresno was very hot in the summer. He dreamed of Sicily and the cool wine cellars and decided to dig himself a cool home underground. The home and courtyards were about 10 acres at one time, including a lake. Someone, not our guide, related that he had an island in the middle of the lake where he still, where he ran a still. And this is from Heather. Heather, thank you for these. So these are both from the forest, for steer underground gardens, which are California historical landmark. 
Very cool, I'd never heard of those. How interesting. Okay, I love this set of cards because it's from a pair of gardening friends who went on a trip together and how much fun is that? Here's to a girls weekend, Minnesota to Chicago, beauty everywhere. We're impressed and I think it's Cantigny in Wheaton, Illinois, but no postcards. That's from Amy and Stacy. And here's a second one from Amy and Stacy. Erin, love Ulbrich. Also love Lurie on our girls weekend from Amy and Stacy. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you, Amy and Stacy. That's, uh, I just can tell you guys had a fabulous time. I'm so happy you went. And thank you for thinking of me on your girls weekend and sending, and sending a card. Two cards. Props to Amy and Stacy on that one. Can I come on your next trip? Okay, oh my gosh, this is, this is, I have to see what the note is. These are some beautiful cards in here. Okay, let's check out the letter. Dear Erin, thank you so much for sharing your gardening know-how. I am new to really hands-on gardening, but have loved gardens always. I live in uh, New Jersey now and have visited several in New York. Of note, Brooklyn Botanical, home to my favorite tree, a weeping European beach. Yes. Weeping European beaches, particularly old ones that you typically find in like old parks and botanical gardens are just fabulous. I am from Minnesota and never seen one before. Amazing tree. Also, New York Botanical is huge and home to wonderful orchid show and Wave Hill, small but on the Hudson, uh, amazing views. I have sent, in place of a postcard, a series of cards printed from a friend's waters color, watercolors. Hope you love them. You guys, these cards are stunning. So I'm gonna show you each of them. They're just, so printed from a friend's watercolors. So she's got one very, um, this is William Bilkey is apparently the artist of these. So this one's called Day Lilies. This one's called Summer Lilies. This one is called Old Roses. This one's called Iris and Poppies. And I want to show you so you can see his name, William Bilkey, on the background there. He is the artist here. And clearly he is a very, very talented person. That's from Polly. Thank you again, Polly. And thank you for sharing your friend's art. How amazing. This is, uh, Cheryl has included some pictures here. I am enclosing two pictures from our recent trip out east. These were taken at the Bridge of Flowers in, oopsies, in Shelburne Falls, Massachusetts. It was constructed in 1908 for trolley use, transporting raw materials. This concrete structure became obsolete by 1927. In April 1929, the Shelburne Falls Women's Club took over the property, which led to the beautiful attraction it remains today. It is maintained by volunteers. Definitely a hidden gem. This is from Cheryl. She lives in Illinois, which is zone 5B. Check this one out. Amazing. Never heard of it. See, this is so wonderful. Thank you, Cheryl, for sharing that. I have never heard of that place, and it sounds amazing. Hi, Erin. I recently visited the Missouri Botanic Gardens. I love the different types of gardens and getting inspired for next year. They had bananas like you have featured paired with sun coleus. I love this pairing. I can't wait to try it out and use your video as a guide as to overwintering the banana. Love the video. Keep growing. Stay dirty. Love that. This is from Teal Mills and she lives in Kansas. That was, thank you. So Missouri Botanic Gardens and I don't know if you guys can, I mean look at those great beds. Sort of a bedding scheme there. Beautiful. All right. Thank you for the postcards. Thank you for the cards. If you've sent me one and you haven't heard it read yet, I have a couple, um, one of the old addresses I used to use for mailing stuff. Before we set up a proper PO box, I was sending things to a different address that wasn't my address. Uh, I still get them, I just get them at work. So sometimes it just takes a little bit for cards to make it from my office to my car to my home. So there'll be more coming. Thank you for sending these. If you have visited a great garden this summer or you're going to and you want to drop me a postcard with what inspired you, I love sharing these. I love getting them from around the world and I love talking with all of you. I can't thank you all enough for being just generally wonderful people. It sounds like I'm laying it on, but I consider you all friends. It is amazing to me that we gardeners are able to come together virtually through this way and um, you all inspire me uh, every day. All right, thank you so much for watching. Long video, I know. Thanks for hanging in there. Uh, we will see you guys soon. Take care.